Fun fact. I really, really, really don't like elevators. Not one of my finer moments. My lack of affection for elevators has nothing to do with claustrophobia or wanting to take the healthier option of the stairs, but is actually because I have high-functioning autism. Autism is a word we're hearing an awful lot at the moment. It's very current. We're hearing it in the media a lot. Um, but the funny thing about autism is there is no norm. No two people with autism have the same experience. So if you stand two people with autism beside each other, they will have completely different perceptions of the world, no more than anyone else. For me, autism means a lot of things. Now, you can go home yourselves and Google what autism consists of for a full symptom list, but I'm just going to give you a brief overview. For me, I take a very literal interpretation of language. So, having grown up here in Ireland, we're very sarcastic. We use a lot of metaphors. So when someone would say, it's raining cats and dogs outside, poor seven-year-old Kira Beth was traumatized at the idea that there were these animals falling from the sky and no one was helping them. You can probably imagine how that might be a barrier in an everyday life. Another example of how autism might affect me is my sensory system. My sensory system is hypersensitive, so loud noises, sudden high-pitched noises or even consistent loud noises, uh, certain textures of clothing or food. I can't eat, or wear, eat certain foods or wear certain clothing because it actually feels like it's burning my skin or it makes me feel ill to my stomach. And finally, what I'm going to talk about today would be an experience that is common to a lot of people who have autism. And it's known as a meltdown. Now, a meltdown is not a scientific term, but it is widely understood. Our brains are constantly processing all of the information we're getting, so all of the lights, all of the sounds, all of the people around us. My brain has a lower threshold for when it becomes overwhelmed. So when my brain is receiving too much information, it's not quite able to process it quickly enough, it kind of shuts down the lines of communication, so I start to lose my speech. And I start crying. It looks basically like a tantrum, except the key difference is I could control a tantrum if I was having one. I can't control a meltdown. The picture of me in the elevator, that is mid-meltdown, because it was fine when it was just me and three other people in the elevator. And then all of a sudden, there were 20 other people in the elevator. And then it was quite noisy, because when you introduce 20 teenagers to an elevator, that's what happens. And then the fluorescent lights were bugging me. So my brain thought it was appropriate to react in such a manner that uh, we were about to be mauled by a large bear. Not quite the same thing, but we're going we're to have to try and establish that difference at another point. So I always knew I was different from the minute I walked into my preschool classroom when I was three years old. It took the rest of the world around me a little bit longer to come to the same conclusion. I was diagnosed with high-functioning autism when I was 14 years old. On paper, officially, that would be considered a late diagnosis. I consider it a right-on-time diagnosis. It came at such a time that I did need the label. I needed it to access services and supports that I couldn't access without it. But I feel personally, for me, if I had received the diagnosis any sooner, there were certain coping mechanisms I just wouldn't have learned myself. But the funny thing with a diagnosis like autism when you're 14 years old is you kind of have an identity crisis. Because there is a long list of symptoms that comes with autism. And some of the symptoms can be overlapped with, you know, having a personality. So it, I found it really, really difficult to draw the line as to this is Kira Beth and this is autism. And the funny thing is there is an awful lot of overlap. So after I was diagnosed, I joined a technology club specifically for 
young people who are on the autism spectrum. And I made friends, and we worked on projects. They were creative digital media, so filmmaking, photography, graphic design. Um, and I kind of started to come into my own because I realized, oh, I'm not the only person who has some of these challenges. These people understand what it's like. And then it kind of clicked. If I have these challenges, and they have these challenges, there's a really good chance there are a lot of other people out there who have these challenges. I suffered a lot because I was different. Um, kids are mean. Kind of a fact of life, I think, unfortunately. So I was bullied, had stuff stolen from me, and just generally had a terrible school experience through no fault of teachers or anyone in the situation. I don't even blame the bullies because they just didn't understand. They had no one to teach them, so I had to. So I decided I was going to dive into the academic journal articles, like any 14-year-old would. Another fun fact, that does not make you the popular kid in school. And I just wanted to learn as much as I could about how my brain worked, how people's brains who were like me worked. And I came across some rather alarming statistics, or at least I found them alarming. In that in a survey carried out in the UK, only 17% of adults on the autism spectrum were in full-time paid employment. 17. In that same survey, they asked the unemployed participants, and 77% of them said they wanted to work, they were willing to work, they were looking for work, they wanted to be involved. Then I came across another survey from another organization, 67% of employers said failure to make eye contact in an interview setting is a nonverbal mistake. Now, when you look at those long lists that Google gives you on red flags for autism, one of the first things that is a common trait between most of them would be failure to make and maintain eye contact. For me, it used to feel like the back of my eyes were burning. It just felt awkward and unnatural. So I decided, in all of my 14-year-old glory, that I was going to change all of these statistics. And I, I started telling people, I'll build an app. I could just about turn on a computer on my own. Um, so I kind of pulled myself together and did a lot of thinking and got, got a friend to build the first six levels of the app. So the app has a photo of a person's face, and over their eyes are shapes. And there are four options across the bottom of the screen. And the idea is they're just matching the shapes. From the code he sent me, I reverse engineered it, took it all apart, dissected it, learned how it worked, and then went on to build the following 54 levels. I was never one for conventional methods. The challenges we have to deal with as individuals, and Every single one of us in this room has some sort of challenge that we have to deal with. They give us really unique insights into problems that no amount of research can give. Through no fault of researchers, when they're researching things, there are perspectives they just cannot get unless they live through something. After the storm passes, after we've overcome the challenges, after we've learned, we're left with a wealth of information. That seems obvious to us now on reflection, but to the person who is just coming up to that challenge, they're oblivious to it. And if we pair that information and that knowledge and combine it with a little bit of empathy, we have the power to create things that change people's lives. The challenges we face open up new possibilities for creativity, innovation, invention, and inspiration. As for me, I plan to continue exploring the many, many possibilities my challenges present me with. I plan to keep using my experiences to pair it with well 
studied research, well understood research, to create things that are going to improve the lives of people who are like me. So maybe that kid in the back of the class won't get bullied, or that girl's phone won't go missing from her locker. I'm also coming to terms with elevators. Thank you. <laughs>